sequence models. Okay, so so far we just saw, yeah, the data isn't the ID. So let's actually see how we can model this. So if I have some dependent random variables, x1 through xt, right? I mean, in arbitrary order, whatever, you know, and they're drawn from some p of x. And just by writing our conditional probabilities, I can write p of x as p of x1 times p of x2 given x1 times p of x3 given x1 and 2 up to p of xt given x1 through xt minus 1. And that I can do no matter whether I have a time series or not, right? I could also even do that in the reverse direction, right? So just to point out that, you know, you can come up with very absurd models. And, you know, it's still, you know, technically correct. It's just that those models are very absurd. So, you know, why bother? Any ideas why you would want to bother? Well, so let's just write this out again. So in one case, all the arrows go to the right. In the other case, all the arrows go to the left. And causality, in other words, reality usually prevents the reverse direction. So the future doesn't affect the present or the past. I mean, unless you watch sci-fi movies where they travel back from you know, the future. Um, and that's why you know, we're not going to see time travel. Anyway, uh, so one way usually to find out which way time goes is you try to model the data with both models and you try to see which one fits better or which one leads to a much more complex explanation. And you can actually mathematically prove under a, a reasonable range of circumstances that the wrong direction of causality leads to the more complex model. So there's a lot of nice work by Bernard Schulkopf and Dominic Janzing in this direction. So they've, they wrote a book on that. Um, read that if you're interested in this work. Um, OK, so how do we deal with this? I mean, after all, this is a deep learning class, right? So one thing we could do is we could have some autoregressive model. So because after all, we're after some term p of xt given x1 through xt minus 1. I could just say, well, you know, that's p of xt and then given some function of all the past data. You know, so far, this is, you know, perfectly OK because I haven't actually specified how smart this function f should be. OK. This is a little bit where the problem lies, that if I have this function to capture everything, then well, it gets really hard to compute in everything. And we'll look at a couple of ways how to fix it. So plan A is I use the Markov assumption. And the Markov assumption just means that if I have this chain, then the dependency ha only can look back so far, namely tau steps. Can somebody tell me what tau is in the graph above? Who votes for 1? Who, who votes for tau equals 1 in the graph above? Okay. Who votes for 2 in the graph? Okay. Okay. Who votes for 3? Okay. Who votes for 0? Okay. So, and so half of the audience doesn't have a strong opinion. The 2's had it, right? Um, so, the dependency here is two steps. So basically, the, you know, the observations two steps into the past, they, can help, they affect what happens next. And in that case, you can write out some autoregressive model, you know, p of xt given x1 up to t minus 1 is, you know, f of xt minus tau up to xt minus 1. And you know, this is a perfectly reasonable model if, you know, tau is long enough if I have a lot of data and all of that. But there are plenty of cases where this actually can fail. But, you know, let's see what we can do. So you could basically solve a regression problem like, you know, x hat is some function f of xt uh, minus tau up to xt minus 1. And then I regress. 
Hmm. Any questions about that? This is, you know, this is a very simple approach, right? So I can just take the past data, I perform the regression, and if that's all that there is to it, we can now all go home and relax and say, well, yeah, we can do time series models. And the obvious thing is, yeah, there's more to it, but we'll start with that. Right. Plan B, and this is something that you know, has been popular for a long time, is a latent variable model. So instead of saying, well, you know, uh, I'm going to truncate that history, I'm going to kind of carry that history around by assuming that there's some hidden state H. And this hidden state gets updated based on, you know, the past observation and the past hidden state. And the new observation depends on, you know, the current hidden state and the XTs. So the green dots are the hidden state, and the blue ones are the observations. And so now, you could easily see, at least, you know, can convince yourself that if ht is essentially a function of ht minus 1, right, that's what we have, and the new observation, then, you know, if my hidden state would, was, you know, really powerful and could store a lot of things, that's exactly the same thing as having a function of all the data from start to finish. It's just a really weird way of writing it down. Okay. So this is a subtle difference, right? So in one option, if we have a Markov model, we just have some function that depends on past observations. So everything's observed and we can basically, you know, form some training data and we solve it. Or we assume that there's some hidden state. Okay. Let me give you an example of such a hidden state model. Actually, your brain is currently solving one of those, at least I hope it does. Namely, there's a hidden state, namely what Alex is thinking when he speaks and Let's assume that I think before I speak, right? Now, what your brain is doing, it's solving the inverse problem. You know, sound comes out of my mouth, goes into your ears, and now, based on the observation, you're trying to infer what the hidden state is of what I might have tried to say when, you know, that noise came out of my mouth. Right. So, this is where your brain is now solving the inverse problem to my problem of generating, making noise from thought, and you're making thought from noise. And when you ask a question, it goes the other way around. Okay, any questions here? So this seems like a quite a subtle uh, distinction, and but it leads to very different algorithms as we will see in a moment. But I wanted to, you know, get that out of the way right now because later on we'll encounter a lot of models which do either plan A or plan B. And mostly plan B actually. So the latent error model is pretty much what we'll entertain ourselves with for the next three lectures. Um, so I want to make sure everybody is kind of cool with why we're doing this. So, yeah, if basically I had some function f of x1 through xt minus 1, right? So this is the function that we wanted, which can be written as some function f of ht minus 1 and xt minus 1. In that case, you know, this is, you know, completely analogous. And there are distributions for which such a form exists. So they're in an alternate universe where spectral methods would be the new exciting thing, and at some point that wasn't clear, um, you could actually prove that certain embeddings are all that you need to deal with certain such models. Okay, but that alternate universe doesn't exist. We're in deep learning land. Um, okay, so you may have heard of some of those things before. And I just want to give you a little bit of a context such that when somebody comes to you and says, well, we don't use deep networks because we use 
blah, like, you know, HMMs or common filters or topic models over time or whatever, that at least you know how what they're telling you fits in with what you're doing, and that what you're doing is just as principled as all the other things, right? So let's assume we have some, you know, temporal sequence of observations like purchases, likes, or app use, or emails, or ad clicks, or queries, or ratings, right? So any of this. Then one thing that I could do is I could just endow this hidden state with some meaning, right? So I could have clusters. People have done that for search where they would break down search into three different types. So there is the navigational or the informational or there's a third type that I've now forgot, but basically you can already see from that that this is very tenuous. And then they would have humans hand label things and model transitions and so on. And yeah, let's put it this way, the company that did this didn't do very well on search. Um, yeah. But basically you could try to model this way, you know, whether you're within the same search session and a lot of other features. You could assume that, you know, there are topics of interest for a user over time. And we did this at some point, it worked quite well for computational advertising. This was at a time when deep learning wasn't quite so popular yet. This was around 2011, 2012. And you'd see how the network then, for instance, learns that, you know, there's, you know, sports or education or health and other things. and and finance, and you can really tell, you can see stories like there's this guy who's into sports, but then he realizes he doesn't have money, then he starts looking for jobs. So you can see those topics interact with each other quite nicely. And yeah, you can tell a nice story. And if you want to have simple interpretable models, it's not a bad place to start. Or then we can look at something which is essentially 1960s technology, namely the common filter. And probably by now, still a lot of control theory lectures will teach you the common filter. And if you're tracking a plane on radar, well, they probably use something like this, right? These are cool things, right? And again, they basically assume that there is, you know, some latent state like where the plane is. And then what you observe is where the radar ping shows up. For instance, in computational biology, you know, you can go over a DNA sequence and you have those introns and exons, which is like, you know, the start part of a function call. So if you think about, you know, transcription like a function call, then, you know, you need to have some way a start and an end of that function call. And you can model that. And yeah, don't be scared about the math. We are not going to do this. But you could do that with deep learning now. You can probably still do a startup if you tell UVC I'm doing deep learning for Compile. Um, okay, don't tell them that I said that. Um, you can do temporal PCA, which is common filters. Basically, you have some latent factor model, right? Latent variables, which are drawn from some normal distribution, and then you have some simple sequential factorial structure. So you know you basically you know have some observations, and then you know, you basically transform the data based on those observations, right? And yeah, this works nicely and mostly, or, you know, basically any, any other thing, right? So this begs the big question, you know, given that people have done this for decades, you know, what am I doing here? Why am I trying to talk you into something new? And the big question is really, should we actually believe all those parametric models, right? Which is a bit of a rhetorical question because if I said yes, then I could go home now, right? So, and actually they're not really true, right? They're just very convenient assumptions that scientists have made to deal with small amounts of data or to force certain structures that they thought should exist for instance, for speech recognition, it's a perfectly reasonable assumption to make that what comes out of people's mouth isn't gibberish, but words, right? And so therefore, you have discrete terms. Um, yeah, so, but then there are more elegant ways of dealing with this. So 
what you basically want is you want to have you know some richer representation. You want to be able to deal with, for instance, the fact that you know people do things at you know random times, not necessarily at quantized every 15 minutes. And yeah, we're gonna have fun with this. So 